Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And when he rose and took the child and his mother by night, and departed to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise man, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region, who were two years old or, yonder, or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. This, was to fulfill, this then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted, because they are no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, and being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a city of Naz called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. This is the word of the Lord. Psalm 122, the psalmist says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And so I hope you too are glad this morning as we look at God's word and as we worship together. Please be seated. I see some familiar faces and some new faces, and I know part of that is because of the July 4th holiday that we just celebrated. So I hope you had a safe and enjoyable July 4th um, but what we'll do today is we'll continue, if you are a new face, um, we'll continue in the series that's going through Matthew. And so for the past couple of weeks, our senior minister, Keith Paulus, he went through Matthew 1, and he showed us about Jesus, this king who was to come. And today, we're going to look at no short passage in all of Matthew 2 that you just saw that was read. Um, but we'll go and see what it means that this king has come. And if you uh, do not know me, my name is Josh. I'm on staff here at Christ Church. And throughout the summer, um, our senior minister, he's taking time to rest and to study. And we'll have different guest preachers who will come in over the next few weeks as we continue to look at Matthew. So as we dive in today to look at Matthew 2, let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, you are good. Your word is good. Your word is truth. And so we pray that as we look at it today, may your word do your work. May it change us where that is needed. May it open our eyes to see wondrous things in your law. May it help us to see that your words are sweeter than honey. And may we desire more and more to worship the true King, Jesus, by looking at your word. We pray that all this would happen by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So today as we look at Matthew 2, I want to begin with a question. I know some of us are from different cultures, but I think most of us, if we think about it, we don't really know what it's like to honor a newborn king. That's unfamiliar to most of us in this room. We don't have a direct line of rulers that we can look to. And typically when there is a king though, especially if he's a good king, maybe you can think of good kings throughout history, the people in that kingdom, they would expect and wait for an heir who would be just as good, if not better, than that good king. You weren't always guaranteed to have a good king, and so if you had one, you would expect and hope 
for his heir to be just as good, if not better. So there's an expectation for that prince, that future king, to be born and then one day rule. And in Jesus' day, if you look at the Roman rulers, there was a great celebration when a future ruler was born. Announcements would be made, proclamations were throughout the land, festivals, gifts giving, ceremonies, it was a big deal. And it was important to announce this future ruler. I know we have some young people in here, or maybe just people who are young at heart, but I actually think if you can't relate to this, what's helpful to picture is actually the opening to The Lion King. And it might sound like something that's silly, but it was actually based trying to show the announcement of a new king. And if you can remember that scene, it starts the movie, the sun rises over the horizon, everyone gathers together, that is all the animals gathered together, they go to the rock, and eventually it culminates with Simba being raised up over, and there's just jubilation. Everyone is celebrating, everyone is happy. Now, of course, this is a sillier, a lesser example, but as we've looked at the last couple of weeks, Jesus' lineage, his birth, and we looked at the introduction to that leading up to that, then we would expect something even greater. This is the son of David. This is the descendant of Abraham. And so we'd expect much greater of a celebration for this sort of good king to come on to the scene. What's interesting, though, is while we look at Matthew and Luke, and both of them show some people who waited expectantly and realized the gravity of the moment that Jesus was born, for the most part, Jesus' birth invites a mixed response. We don't get this jubilation. We don't get this excitement. But the royal one has come, and the question we're looking at today is, who is this one that has come? Who is this new king, and how is he received? So today's passage, it's in Matthew 2, It'll cover three episodes in Jesus' early life. And each episode follows a, a sequence, and so it's kind of a pattern. But it's segmented based on specific, markets, uh, specific markers, which you can see in the passage before you. You can see for each segment of the episode, there will be dreams where God intervenes and his messengers provide instruction. There will be a specific fulfillment, fulfillment according to scripture. And I think the point of this is in marking off these episodes is that they're not here accidentally with these dreams, these prophecies that are fulfilled. Rather, they work in conjunction to show that while we aren't given many details, maybe not as much as we would hope about Jesus' early life, Matthew, inspired by the Spirit, has a purpose in sharing these specific events. And so I believe that purpose is to show us something about this child-born king who fulfills the scriptures. So in each episode, we'll look at an event that took place in Jesus' early life, the way this fulfilled the scriptures, and then an invitation to respond in light of this. That's the pattern we'll see in the three episodes that we'll look at. And so if you'd like to follow along with notes, here are the three episodes in this chapter. The first one is we'll see that Jesus is a king worthy of worship. The second one is we'll see that king, Jesus is a king who experiences hardships but embodies hope. And third, we'll see that Jesus is a king from Nazareth. And in each of these sections, once again, we'll have fulfillments of scripture from the Old Testament. And we'll spend a good amount of time looking at these because Matthew is really trying to ground how Jesus fulfills these expectations. So I hope you have a Bible with you. Once again, Matthew 2 is printed here in the bulletin. I think there's some Bibles in the pews, but if not, there's also Bibles in the back. So let's look at this together. Uh, beginning with that first episode. This is from verses 1 to 12. And it's about a king who is worthy to be worshipped. So let's consider the event that took place in this episode, the scripture that was fulfilled, and then the invitation to respond. So what took place? Look at verse 1. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem, saying... Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Now when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So what event takes place so far? Well, we get a first in Matthew. We get a first mention of a king. In verse 1, we get a mention of a king. And if you were here once again for the last couple of weeks, or you know the first chapter of Matthew, then you understand the buildup for who is this king 
this son of David, this descendant of Abraham, whom the Old Testament promises look to. But who is the first person mentioned as a king? In verse 1, it's Herod. So is Herod this king that all of these promises build up to? No. Uh, The chapter points to clear reasons why. But to fill you in a little bit on Herod, this was not a guy that you wanted as your king. And he was not the promised king. Herod was a client king, which means he was put in place by the Roman authorities. And he was known for being ruthless. He had several of his own family members executed, including one of his wives. And he had many conspirators executed, even if they were proved or not. And on his deathbed, Josephus records, he's a historian for us, that he ordered for people to be gathered up and murdered so that tears would be shed in remembrance of him. So this was not the expected king that we are led to look for. And the wise men know this. So when they approach Herod, these wise men, or magi, are asking, where is this king of the Jews? And it's interesting with these wise men, we don't know much about them. We don't know how many came. We don't know where exactly they came from, though you can make an educated guess, perhaps it was Persia or Babylon. And this was likely because Magi stood for a priestly group. And this later came to be known for people who were um, enchanters or astrologers. And if you want a good picture of this profession, actually the Greek translation of the Old Testament and Daniel uses the word Magi over and over again to describe those wise men. And Daniel, Uh, says in chapter 5, verse 11, that Daniel was over. He was the chief of these wise men, these magi. So those are the two people so far. Herod, he's not the king that you want. The wise men who are seeking the real king. And then the third group that's mentioned is in verse 4. When Herod hears this, they're seeking the true king, he assembles all the chief priests and scribes of the people. Now these were the religious leaders, and scribes were experts in the Mosaic law. So why does all this take place? Well, once again, the wise men are coming to seek Jesus, and they're coming to Jerusalem. And that makes sense if you're seeking the king of the Jews. And when they ask Herod, it's as if they're saying, once again, we know you're not this king. Where is he? Where is this king of the Jews? And we don't have much clear insight into why they came. All we're told is they followed a star, and they wanted to worship him. Now, perhaps these magi had learned about a future messiah, because of the faithful work of someone like Daniel in exile, the chief of the Magi. Perhaps he had shared the promises that would lead to this Christ-born king. But I think the fact that we don't know all the details, how this all worked out, how the star led them, I think that's part of the point. I think what's really clear about the Magi is that as verse 2 says, if you look at verse 2, we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. That's the clear point. They're coming to worship the true king. And this is another unique part of this event. The Magi, Gentiles from a distant land, are the first to recognize King Jesus. And Matthew has them as the first and only party to actually call Jesus king and then respond in worship. And so all of this causes Herod great trouble. That's what verse 3 shows. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And rightfully so. Just as the Magi knew, you are not this promised king, Herod knows he's not the promised king. Unlike Jesus, he's not the one to come from the line of David to bless all the nations. Instead, he's here because he was appointed by Rome. And Jerusalem is also troubled. And I don't think this means that they went around and asked every single person, and then every single person responded and said that we're troubled. But I think Matthew is preparing us for what comes later in Matthew 23. You can write that down and look it up later, but in Matthew 23, that's where Jesus laments over the city because they were not being willing to be gathered in. So the wise men, they're seeking the true king. Herod knows he's not that king, and he turns and goes to the chief priests and the scribes, asking them where the Christ is to be born. And they understand, based on the scriptures, primarily here Micah 5, 2, to provide the answer that this new king will be born in Bethlehem. So then we have the wise men, they continue on their journey to visit Jesus, and that's the event that's taking place. Which leads us then to that prophecy from Micah 5.2, the scripture that is fulfilled. So let's look at the scripture that's fulfilled in this episode. Let's look once again at Matthew chapter 2, verses 5 through 6. So they, that's the chief priests and scribes, they told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, 
are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Now once again, this is primarily from Micah 5.2, but if you go down to Micah 5 verse 4, just a couple of verses down, it'll talk about this shepherd ruler, and so I think they're thinking of that as well. And the idea here is that Bethlehem, it is a small town, but it's from the land of Judah, and a ruler shall come from there who will be a shepherd. Why is that important? Who does this bring to mind? Well, Judah was the tribe of kings, and Bethlehem was actually David's hometown. And of course, David was the famous shepherd king. But you see what's happening here. The scripture is not speaking about David. It's pointing to a greater shepherd king who is coming out of this small town. And this is an expectation that has been building up for hundreds of years. Micah was written 700 years before this event. But God had not forgotten his promise. He would keep his promise to give his people a true king. So this fulfillment shows us a few things. The first is that it's Jesus, not Herod, or any other ruler who is the long-awaited good shepherd king. And the second thing is, even in the small reference here, God keeps his promises. He has not forgotten. And so you can trust in a promise-keeping God. So that's the event. We looked at the prophecy that was fulfilled. What then is the response? So we understand that the significance taking place here is that this long-awaited king has come. But now the question is, how do you respond to the long-awaited king? And we see three common responses to Jesus' kingship right here in this passage. We see the chief priests and scribes, they know the scriptures. They're able to point and tell them where Jesus would be born, but they're apathetic. So that's one response, that of apathy. A second response is, Herod knows enough to fear Jesus. He didn't know the scripture. He didn't know the reference to Micah 5 too. He had to ask, but he knows there's a usurper to his throne, to his power. So he fears Jesus and he opposes him. The second response is that of opposition. And the third one comes from the Magi. And they know enough just to seek Jesus. They don't know exactly where he'll be, but they know enough to worship him. And that's a third response to Jesus being king, is to worship him. So let's look at the first common response to Jesus, that of apathy or indifference. This is to say there's just no need for Jesus. And this is something to be careful of, this idea of being indifferent toward hearing that Jesus is king. Really, you're thinking that Jesus is king, I've heard it announced, but it has no bearing or impact on my life. And the religious leaders, they had the most knowledge out of all of the three groups. Once again, they point to the scripture. But though the wise man traveled far with just a little bit of knowledge, the religious leaders are not even willing to seek and at least see what this could be about. That's a response to be careful of. Be careful if you've heard it proclaimed and you hear it proclaimed as we go through Matthew that Jesus is king, but you don't think that has a bearing on your life. You don't think you need to act. You know about him, but you don't need to worship him. In other words, you have a head full of knowledge, but no heart stirred of affection. So beware of that response, that of indifference. And the second response is by Herod, that of opposition. So verse 8 says, uh, kind of an availed response here, and he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. So Herod wants to find the king so he can worship him. And we'll get into more of what this means in the next episode, but Herod has not had a change of heart. He sees a rival. Herod has power, but he's envious of anyone else who would make a claim to that power or take that power away. He doesn't want to give it up. And so for some people, there is no room for another king. And be careful of this, of pride, of envy, that would not make room for the acknowledgement of Jesus in your life. And the third response, the one we'll spend the most time on, is that of worship. And this comes from the wise men. And I love how Matthew describes these people as they come to Jesus. It's a fitting response, the one that we're waiting for, to understanding that the long-awaited king has finally come. Let's look at verses 9 to 11. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. 
And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. So what do they do in response to this king? Verse 9 says they seek him. They seek after this king. Verse 10, they rejoice exceedingly when they see where he is. And then when they finally see the king in verse 11, this child-born king, they worship him and they respond by giving him their treasure. This is the appropriate response to the king. And for this fitting response of worship, understand that being a part of Jesus' kingdom, it's not dependent on where you were born, like those who were in Jerusalem, or your status, like Herod, or even prior knowledge, like the chief priests and scribes, or if you think you came from a religious family. If you hear a clear proclamation that Jesus is king, respond appropriately and worship him. He is a king from the line of Abraham. He is a king for the nations. And the nations, here the Magi, come and are invited to be a part of his kingdom. And this should give you hope. This should give you hope in your efforts to pray for and share with your family, your friends, your neighbors, those who might not have status or background, that they too are invited to worship the king. So that's the first episode. Jesus, the great shepherd king, He's a king for the nations and he's worthy of worship. And the response this invites in all of us is, if he is the true king, which he is, will you worship him? So let's look now at the second episode that we'll cover today. And that's from verses 13 down to 18. And it's perhaps the longest one we'll look at, but it's a king who experiences hardship, but embodies hope. So once again, it's verses 13 down through 18. So in this episode, we'll see that Jesus is a king who does both of those things. He experiences hardship. He gives us hope. And we'll see once again, there's events that take place, scripture that's fulfilled in Jesus, and the invitation to respond. So let's look at those verses, verses 13 through 18, once more. Um, I'll read them here. Now, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious. And he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. So, This episode focuses in now on Herod's response. Herod's response is that of opposition. And this event shows us that Jesus, he is altogether God. Last week we talked about Matthew 1.23. He's Emmanuel. He's God with us. And that means he's in our midst. He experiences and he's well acquainted with the challenges and difficulties and heartbreak of a world bent by sin. So Herod had schemed in the previous episode to find a way to trick the wise men. Remember, he said he wanted to worship Jesus. But however, in this episode, we see that it's clear what his true intention was. And what's interesting is though he gave a veiled response in verses 12 and 13, both the wise men and Joseph are made clearly aware of his indications. And so the angel of the Lord warns Joseph and says, this is what Herod plans to do. So Joseph has to flee by night to Egypt with Mary and Jesus because Herod is set on destroying Jesus. And as verse 16 continues the narrative, we see clearly that Herod is fully raged against this child. His opposition to his rule is so intense that he's willing to kill any male child in Bethlehem and that region under the age of two. And this was not out of character once again for someone as cruel and vindictive as Herod. 
And unfortunately, it wasn't out of character in that day for someone in the ancient world to commit these type of atrocities to consolidate their rule. Bethlehem was not a small region, so this intense hatred and desire to root out King Jesus led to much evil committed by King Herod here. And that's something that we, we can't just gloss over. Um, and the scripture that we'll, be, we'll talk about that's quoted in Jeremiah 31, 15, it will speak to this agony and give words to this agony. But the events of Jesus' early life show us a few things in this episode. The first is that Jesus experienced and understood hardships. The King of King, he condescends to be God with us. And in one of the earliest moments of his life, he is on the run, threatened to be killed. This isn't a king removed from everyday life. He's not pampered and waited upon. This is a king who can say he can empathize with the pain and tragedy of this life. And there's really no way to comprehend the atrocity of what takes place in these verses. This cruelty and disregard for human life that's on display just to make sure that the rightful king doesn't take his rightful throne. But you have a king who understands. And the second thing this shows us is that while Herod schemes, God executes his divine will. Even in the midst of great evil here, there is a greater good. Herod is not the first one to oppose God and his people. And while there is suffering that takes place under wicked rulers, the true king is ultimately the just and righteous one that we long for and hope in. And so that's what we'll see in the two Old Testament passages quoted here that we'll look together. So we've seen this event that takes place but let's look at the scripture that it fulfills. And I have to say up front, there's two fulfillments mentioned during this event, and we'll need to take the necessary time to understand them appropriately. Um, the first is in verse 15. It's from Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. And the second is from verses 17 and 18. It's from Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 15. So let's look at how these prophecies can help us understand what's going on and what it says about Jesus and how he fulfills these. And as we look at these prophecies, I'm sure you're already, if you're looking at it in your bulletin, I'm sure you're already aware that this isn't quite the same prophecy as given earlier from Micah. So if you remember earlier in that first episode, Micah's was relatively straightforward from chapter 5, verse 2. It talked about how a ruler would be born in Bethlehem, where Jesus was born, and this was fulfilled by Jesus, who was that ruler and king. So simple enough, that makes sense. We can see how Micah was fulfilled in Jesus' birth. But let's look at the first prophecy from Hosea 11 here. I'll read the verse again. This is Matthew chapter 2, verse 15. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. Now on first glance, we can see that Jesus, he had to go to Egypt to flee Herod. And we understand that Jesus is called the son of God. That will happen next week as we look at Matthew 3. But we have to wonder why this specific fulfillment. Was this really just supposed to be a simple one-to-one -one prediction? If so, it looks a little bit clumsy and out of place. So I think it's helpful here to pause and reconsider. The problem is probably more so with us and how we understand scriptural fulfillment. Um, so it'll be a quick pause. It won't be too painful. But I hope that as we look at what the Bible means when it says to fulfill something, this will be helpful, not only as we look at this passage, but in your reading of the Bible as a whole. I think it's truly essential to take this time to understand what this episode says about Jesus and how he fulfills scripture. So ready? So here's a couple of key principles to help in understanding fulfillment. Here's the first one. The first is when we look at events and people in the Old Testament, they can often prefigure or provide an example of what Jesus will be like or what he will do. This is a big word, it's called typology, but really what this word just means is a form or a shape or an example pointing to something. So again, the idea is that as we look through scripture, we see that some people and events in the Old Testament serve as prefigured shapes or examples that point us to what Christ would do or be. For example, here's one from Matthew's Gospel. It's from Matthew 27, verse 46. This is where Jesus, he's dying on the cross, and he says the words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now these words actually come from Psalm 22, where David cries them out in his moment of agony. And David was a king, 
and he experienced moments of pain, and he felt abandonment. But David ultimately gives shape and points to a greater king who would come from his own line, and Jesus, who would cry those words in total agony, total abandonment on the cross. So sometimes, the Old Testament, it gives us an example that helps give us a glimpse. It's not perfect, but it's a glimpse of the coming Savior. It points to Christ. So that's the first principle. The second principle is that we want to understand what the Bible means when it says fulfill. Fulfill. So when we think of prophecies, especially with the word fulfill, we often think that that means there's an Old Testament prophecy, and it's intended to be a simple, direct prediction. So there's just a one-to-one correspondence. But that's not really how the word is always used in the New Testament. It's helpful to realize that fulfill in the New Testament usually means to bring something to its intended goal, to bring something to completion, in that sense, to fulfill what is lacking in something. So consider how often in the Old Testament there were things that are just a shadow, just a shadow, but they find their fulfillment in Christ, those things which the shadow points to. An example of this actually comes from our study in Hebrews, if you remember. In Hebrews 9, it mentions the Day of Atonement. Now, the Day of Atonement, it was established in Leviticus, but it ultimately finds its completion in Christ, as Hebrews 9 points out. Christ was the perfect, once-for-all sacrifice. He doesn't have to keep going before. It's complete. It's perfect. It's fulfilled in Him. Or recently, you can think of Colossians. We just went through Colossians together as a church as well. Colossians 2.17 talks about the shadow of things in the Old Testament that are fulfilled, and they ultimately point to the one who created that shadow, the substance. Colossians 2.17 says the substance of these things is Christ. So he's the real thing. Now, we want to be careful. This doesn't mean that we should just run around and loosely connect dots and hope they create a picture But we want to be wise, and we do want to understand that Jesus is clear when he speaks of himself and says that all the law and the prophets, all of the scriptures point to and are fulfilled in him. And these principles help us do that. So that's just a little bit of an understanding of how Christ fulfills scripture. And with those principles in mind, let's go back to understanding the scriptures here that Christ fulfills in this episode in Matthew 2. So the first fulfillment is from 2 verse 15. This is from Hosea once again. And if you look at Hosea 11 as a whole, I know we went through Hosea, but if you look at it as a whole, it's really a historical account. You can read through it, you can write down and look through it later today, but it starts with declaring God's love and how he showed that love by calling his people out of Egypt. This Exodus event, from where Egypt is often pointed back to by prophets, it was there where Pharaoh said that he was going to kill all the baby boys, but God preserved Moses who eventually led the people out of Egypt. And Hosea 11 goes on to recount how the Lord faithfully cared for his people. But ultimately, it also points out that they were unfaithful to the Lord. Hosea 11:2 it says, The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning offerings to idols. So it's about the founding of Israel who the Lord cared for like a son. He delivered them out of Egypt. He loved them, but ultimately, on their own, they were unable to faithfully love the Lord, which resulted in their exile. That's the original context of Hosea 11, a history of God's calling his people out of Egypt. Now let's look, let's go from Hosea to Matthew and look at the context in Matthew, where there are striking similarities to what is being brought to mind. So here in Matthew, Herod opposes God, and he calls for the murder of all the male babies in Bethlehem. But Jesus is preserved and finds a way to escape. In Exodus, Pharaoh opposed God and calls for the murder of all the male babies. But Moses, God preserved him and gave him a way of escape. And just like Pharaoh could not stand against God, Herod here cannot stand against God. And God calls his people out of Egypt to be faithful to him, his son. Here, Jesus is called out of Egypt. But that's where the similarities end. If you look back at Hosea 11, it points out the history of Israel and that ultimately they could not be faithful and they do not have full rest in the land they were promised, but they were exiled. So will the same thing take place then in Jesus' early life that we're looking at and as we look out the whole of Matthew? 
Well, this is where you can get excited about King Jesus, the differences here. When Jesus is called out of Egypt, Matthew will show us, starting from here, that this greater one, God's son, he will not fail. He will go into the wilderness. He will face temptation. He will fulfill the law. And he will ultimately make a way for his people to the promised land. And that's one reason we can have hope in Christ. He's faithful. And that's the first fulfillment. But what about the second passage? The second fulfillment comes from Jeremiah 31. That's in verse 17 through 18. It says, Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. And I believe one reason it's placed here as well is just because of the words that it gives tragedy to this situation that Herod enacted. It depicts one of the most sorrowful passages in Scripture. You can read Jeremiah 31 later, but in the context of Jeremiah 31, he's speaking as they're being led off to exile. And so Rachel here is symbolizing the mothers of the nation, watching their sons ripped from them, watching families torn apart as they're being brought off to exile in Babylon. So it's a weeping, it's a loud lamentation because children were taken away and also because they think the promises are not being kept. And in Matthew, we see the grief of the mothers in Bethlehem because of Herod's evil intentions. And this link shows us that just as the mothers grieved in exile, watching their sons being taken away, the grieving continues now. And why? They still are under an oppressive ruler in Herod. Herod enacts that role of an oppressive, wrongful king over the people. And so the mourning that occurs in Jeremiah 31.15 gives language to the mourning that certainly occurs here in Bethlehem. But is that it? Does Herod have the last word? Are we left with this tragic account and, and nothing else? If Herod and rulers like him are the ones who have all the power, then doubtless there will be more tragedy that continues to occur. But friends, don't think that Jesus is a stranger to hardship. Just as God heard his people groaning in Egypt, Jesus hears the groaning here. He knows that people mourn and groan under oppressive regimes. And I think that's why we have to ask, out of all the passages in the Old Testament, why choose to pull us back into Jeremiah's specific language of mourning? Why that specific chapter of Jeremiah 31? And once again, I'd encourage you to read through the whole of Jeremiah 31 and look at the context that's there. But if you're familiar with it, Jeremiah 31, its greater context is actually that of overwhelming hope. 15 is kind of a drop of sadness in an ocean of hope. And so Matthew, familiar with the scriptures, he knows that. Look at Jeremiah 31, verses 16 through 17. They come right after the verse quoted here with me. This is from Jeremiah 31, verses 16 to 17. Um, I'll go ahead and read 15, actually. Thus says the Lord, A voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Thus says the Lord, Keep your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for there is a reward for your work, declares the Lord, and they shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope for your future, declares the Lord, and your children shall come back to their own country. So ultimately, in Jeremiah's context, he's saying this, looking forward to deliverance from oppression and exile. But the people here in, in his day, they were still under that oppressive rule. They had to look forward to it. They were still under exile in Babylon. Now, I think Matthew is quoting from both of these passages in close proximity and in the context of this King Jesus to show us something really important. Hosea, it brings to mind the history of the people of Israel. They're not ultimately faithful, and that will lead to their exile. Jeremiah, where we're looking here, shows us the pain that they felt the pain that specifically pointed to a time when they were in that exile, waiting for a savior. So as a whole, Jeremiah 31 leaves this expectation, this promise yet to be fulfilled. And Matthew, he's been clear 
in showing that Jesus is the one to fulfill these promises and expectations. Turn with me to the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1. It's the one we looked at two weeks ago. Matthew chapter 1. So you can see the three sections, Pastor Keith went over these, of Jesus descending from Abraham, that's verse 2. Jesus descending from David, that's verse 6. And the last clear section is the deportation to Babylon, that's verse 12. Matthew 1, verse 17 says, So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. So there's a clear structure here. It starts with Abraham, moves to David, and then the deportation to Babylon. What does that lead to? As verse 17 recaps, this leads to Christ. Ultimately, the people waited in exile. And even now, they were under the false oppressive rule of Herod. But what's changed? Jesus has arrived. He is that hope that has been looked forward to. He is God's son in whom he is well pleased. And he will be faithful to deliver from exile and bondage to inaugurate that very new covenant mentioned in Jeremiah 31. That's why this fulfills scripture. And though there was tragedy in exile, there's tragedy that Herod brought about, and ultimately there's tragedy that all of us feel. It can only be undone because King Jesus brings about the restoration that Jeremiah 31 looks forward to. And so that's the prophecies, the scriptures that are fulfilled. Now let's look at the response to this king who both experiences hardship but embodies hope. Verse 19 shows us that ultimately, Herod, though he was the one who was seeking to kill Jesus, it's kind of written as an afterthought, but Herod dies. Herod dies, and Jesus is the one who lives. And because Jesus lives, and the specific life he goes on to live, perfectly faithful to the Lord, we are able to have hope. One of the implications is that we meet here today and worship because of this hope. Surely there are pharaohs, herods, kings, and rulers that will continue to rage and plot against the Lord and his anointed. And this can cause real pain. But Jesus is not here only to deliver from another oppressive ruler in Herod. That would be one thing to celebrate. But he's here for much more. He's here to bring about ultimate deliverance from the oppression of sin and death. That's what Jeremiah 31 is about. And we'll get to that in Matthew 27 and 28, that even death is no match for King Jesus. Jesus is faithfulness personified, and he will not fail, he will not be defeated. Now this doesn't mean, as we respond, that there isn't real pain in life. Jesus endured hardships, and there are many passages similar to Jeremiah 31.15 that deal with mourning in response to a world that's bent with infested with sin. So as Christians, we don't overlook this and we don't lessen tragedy. But if God had not preserved Jesus, there would be no real encouragement that I could offer you through those moments. And that's not the case. So in the midst of hardships, you can know, one, that Jesus understands your hardships and you can respond with hope and trust. And that's part of this response. Part of the question to this is, does it give you hope and trust in Jesus in the midst of your hardships? Do you realize that you have a king who has gone through the hardships and difficulties in this life? Do you trust him when you're going through those moments? We've sung it earlier, but Jesus is the only one you can cry out to and say, by your mercy, come deliver us. Surely he heard those cries and he came to deliver us. But the other response we saw here is Herod's, and once again, is to oppose and get rid of Jesus. And friend, you don't want to be in that position of standing against Jesus. He can't be conquered, not by Pharaoh, not by Herod. It's reality, and reality stands in front of you. So the question is, will you hope in Jesus and trust in his faithfulness, or will you oppose him and try to remove him? Let's turn now to the last episode that we'll look at today in Jesus' early life. This is from verses 19 down to 23. And once again, we'll look at the events that take place 
the scripture it fulfills, and the response that it invites. So here, starting in chapter 2, verse 19. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. So in this part of the story now, we continue to see the divine activity through dreams that are guiding and preserving as they have so far. And through that, Joseph is informed that it's safe to return to Israel. However, though Herod has died, his son Archelaus is now in rule, and he was just as ruthless as his father was. Um, one short snippet from his life is when Archelaus was hoping to solidify his kingship in this area, he traveled to Rome, and most in the, sen didn't, in the Senate didn't want him to be king because of his wide-known cruelty. They knew about it even in this smaller region. And so Joseph is naturally concerned given that his son is now in power. So through another warning, he goes to live in Nazareth in Galilee. But there ultimately was a deeper reason for him to go there, which Matthew tells us in verse 23. If you look back there again, the reason he went there is he went and lived in a city called Nazareth so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. So let's look now at this scripture fulfillment. What does it mean that he would be called a Nazarene? And the first thing to notice is that Matthew does not give us a specific prophet. There's not a specific scripture that he points to. So what do we do? In the first episode, we had one prophecy. In the second episode, we had two. And now, we don't know. So the first thing is we can determine, maybe Matthew, he just isn't good at his craft. He just doesn't know the sources that he's citing. But this is readily dismissed for a few reasons. One, if you look at the whole of the book, Matthew far and away directly quotes from the Old Testament more than any other gospel writer. For another, even in the immediate context, Matthew consistently quotes from a specific source. In chapter 1, 22 through 23, he will be called Emmanuel, quoting from Isaiah. In chapter 2, verses 5 through 6, he quotes that he'll come from Bethlehem, quoting from Micah. In verse 15, he quotes this, uh, what we have here from Hosea, that out of Egypt I have called my son. And then verses 17 and 18, he quotes from Jeremiah about this lamentation. So this picks up again in Matthew 3, a direct quote again. So there's, that's not really the case here. The third thing we can kind of disregard is that we have to understand Matthew's so familiar with the Old Testament that even when there are no, no direct quotations, you can see how clearly he helps us understand the connections between Jesus' life and ministry in the Old Testament through the many patterns that he fulfills, where Jesus is the greater Abraham, where Jesus is the greater Moses, where Jesus is the greater David. So we can safely say Matthew did not just simply make a mistake and not know what he was doing. So what then? What do we do? I think it's helpful to realize that this is a very unique fulfillment it's not according to, once again, a singular prophet, but the plural prophets. What does that mean? Now, while there are some attempts to focus on maybe some wordplay or search for the basis of the word Nazareth in Old Testament, you could find those interesting, but I don't think they quite fit with Nazareth and the context here in Matthew. I think we have to ask ourselves, what does it mean to be a Nazarene, a person from Nazareth? And then how would this be something that the prophets speak of? So for the first point, to understand this scripture being fulfilled in Jesus, what does it mean that Jesus is from Nazareth? What's the significance of that for his identity? To begin with some context on Nazareth, it was very insignificant. Some estimates are that there are as few as 500 people who lived there, and it was not even a major city in Galilee. And if you want to know what people thought of that town, you can go to a familiar passage in John 1, where Nathaniel someone whom Jesus describes as truly an Israelite and whom there is no deceit, 
Well, he shows no deceit, and he plainly says, Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? When told about Jesus being from Nazareth. And Nazareth continues to be a place of obscurity and difficulty later in Jesus' ministry. Later in Matthew 13, you'll see the response that Jesus gets from his own hometown of Nazareth. This is also recorded in Mark 6 and Luke 4. But this is where he goes into uh, to teach, and the people are astonished by his teaching, and they look at him, and in essence they say, is this the man from Nazareth, the man from lowly beginning? They know his family, they know where he's from, he's from their hometown. And they take offense at him. And as Luke records, they even try to throw him down the cliff. So Nazareth is a place of no importance, it's a place of scorn, and a place of rejection. So back to our earlier question, how does this fulfill the prophets? Well, over and over again, the prophets, plural, speak of how Jesus will be despised and of humble origin. And we see that fulfilled in Jesus' life. A few prophecies that speak to that. Psalm 22 mentions that he will be scorned by everyone, despised by the people. He will be mocked. Psalm 31, he will be in contempt by neighbors and closest friends. Isaiah 53 talks about how he will be despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering. This is King Jesus from Nazareth, a place of low esteem, rejection, a place that's despised. He receives rejection and scorn from the very people that he came to save. So yes, Jesus is a king worthy of worship, and he's a king who cannot be conquered, but he also fulfills scripture in that he's a king from Nazareth. He's one who's despised and rejected. So this all leads us to a close of this episode with an invitation to respond. How will you receive this king from Nazareth? Will you identify with him? It's interesting as we think about an invitation to respond to this. In Acts, we can see a few examples of how early believers were identified. They were given a few different names or terms that they were called some that we still use today. And a few of those names, one being Christians. They were called Christians in Antioch. A second is that they were called followers of the way. But they were also called, in Acts 24, 15, by others as Nazarenes, those who followed Jesus. And this was likely derogatory. But the point is, they were willing to identify with Jesus despite the connotations. And you are likely aware that there is a real cost throughout the world for identifying with Jesus. We prayed for some of these places today. Believers around the world are often despised, rejected, imprisoned, and killed. And I encourage you actually to take a moment and look at resources that share about how these believers are doing so that you can remember them, so that you can pray for them and support them. But they're suffering because they identify with the Christ, with Jesus from Nazareth. And maybe there's been a cost for you in identifying with Jesus. Maybe you've lost friendships. Maybe you've been ridiculed. Maybe it's even caused a rift between you and your family. Or perhaps you're sitting here and you're just weighing that cost of being associated with Jesus. You've thought about the shame that it might bring to openly mention that you follow him to those you know. You might be weighing that right now. You've heard that he's king, but you've also you've also understood that there's a cost to identifying with him. It's easy to consider a king and follow him if he does all the things that I like and all the things that my friends like. But that's not the case. What about identifying with a king when he does what is unpopular, when it carries a cost? What if it means that coworkers, classmates, closest friends know that you openly identify with this Jesus from Nazareth? Perhaps you're sitting and you've been weighing this, thinking this through. So the question remains, how will you receive King Jesus? Will you identify with this King from Nazareth? Jesus reminds his followers later in John 15 that if you are hated or you suffer hardship in the world, it's because he was first hated and suffered hardship. But the thing is, when you recognize Jesus in his full beauty, as a king, and you worship him, unlike rulers and powers of this world, you know that he cannot be conquered. He is the king who has overcome the world. When you recognize that, 
that there's no power greater than he is, even if there is a scorn or a cost, you can see that it's worth it. You can see that it's worth it to identify with Jesus from Nazareth. And that final invitation brings us to the close of these three episodes in Jesus' early life. He keeps promises. He fulfills expectations. He is a worthy king, a king above all other kings who cannot be conquered. So my prayer is that you will be wise and you will receive him, full of joy, eager to worship him, that you would identify with King Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Importantly, we thank you for what it tells us about you, what it tells us about your son. We thank you for sending Jesus to be that king that we can look to. Thank you for sending Jesus, who is a king who is worthy of our worship. Thank you for sending Jesus, who's a king that understands the hardships of this life, but yet does not leave us without hope. Thank you for sending King Jesus. We pray that we would consider this, that we would understand what it is that you have to say about Jesus, and that we would respond accordingly. In Jesus' name, amen.